Last week we celebrated Shavuot. Out of all the holidays in Judaism, outside of the Halacha, Torah, Orthodox Jews who keep the mitzvot, you know, and they understand Pesach, Shavuot, and all that, outside of these people, which is a very small minority of the Jewish people today, Shavuot is the least known holiday. So called it's first of all it's seven days and then an eighth day. You sit outside in the in the sukkah and so forth. The Pesach people know because they eat matzah and so forth. At least they know that there's something something a holiday called Pesach. Uh Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, everybody knows that and so forth. But Shvod is one day in the States two days and nobody really heard about it. However, what does it commemorate? Shuad commemorates the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people, to the Hebrews, whatever, on Mount Sinai. And last week, when we had the Chag, so there were a number of articles in the newspapers <coughs> saying, taking the opportunity to talk about uh, Jewish identity and what, how do we relate to this whole issue? So, this guy he says that Jewish identity requires the belief that at Sinai God gave the Torah to the Jewish people. In other words, part of any identity of Jewishness, of Judaism, for this guy and others like him who wrote last week, that included as a fundamental tenet, a fundamental thing that there was a giving of the Torah to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai. And he says, as far as he's concerned, this particular guy, which is echoed by many others, that's essential, essentially a part of Jewish identity. Along with other things, but certainly this. So, even though it's not well known, nevertheless it's one of the most important holidays because it commemorates the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people. But he also admits in his articles... I'm sorry, who is the he? Uh, in the Jerusalem Post? Guy. Oh, he yeah. didn't want to say. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, he also admits that all, most people outside, the great majority or all of the people outside of the Dati people, do not believe this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Okay. So, first point is that Har Sinai has no special status in the Torah system. It has no holiness, it has no Kedusha, it's not commemorated by anything. The giving of the Torah is commemorated, by Shavuot, but that it was given at Har Sinai is not essential to the commemoration. So the holiday is saying, here's the giving of the Torah, but it happened to be at Har Sinai. What's important is that the Torah was given by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Moshe Rabbeinu. That's the Ikar. Okay, so in the Chumash text we have the Jewish people uh, at the time saying, Nase Venishma. When Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them about this Torah that he's receiving, you know, they said, Nase Venishma. And it's repeated a different way and so on, but the basic point is they said they're going to do and follow the Torah and attend to it. Watch it. And I'm not interested tonight in getting into what, what's the Naseh Benishma. There's a lot of material on doing and hearing. Usually you hear first and then you do. Uh, that's not the point for tonight. The basic point is that they had this acceptance of the Torah, of the Torah system. Uh, indeed, in Chazal, in the sages of the Talmud, they talk about the experience of Yamsuf of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Jewish people at the time had an experience higher than Yechezkel the Novi. 
In other words, there was a tremendous, tremendous impact of the Yitziat Mitzrayim on the people. And this carried over into, into their saying, yes, we're going to keep this Torah. Okay. But the question is, so they say, not seven Ishma. By the time we come to the Chazal in the Gemara, which is a thousand years later, we see something very interesting. Chazal say, well, at that time, the Jewish people received the Torah without free will. And there's a famous Chazal, they put, they were standing at the foot of the mountain of Har Sinai, and the, they put a barrel over on top of them and said, in effect, you have no choice. You've got to accept the Torah now. So it wasn't accepted by free will, by choice. It was accepted under duress or even from the positive. That the experience of Yitziat Mitzrayim was so powerful that they didn't, it, it, it affected the emotion, the decision of what happened after that didn't come, it came from the experience, but still bypassed free will. You could do something because of this from the side, it was so powerful an experience that it just carried over naturally into accepting the Torah. But the point of this Chazal is, in the Gemara, that it wasn't done by free will. Now that says a lot. One of the things most important it says is that somehow the Jewish people are hanging in the middle. They need something to complete the acceptance of the Torah. God could give it, but where was the acceptance? You know, like if somebody's giving you a matana, a gift, and you don't accept it, there's a question whether you gave a gift. Giving a gift means somebody receiving the gift, or whether giving the gift means giving, but you don't receive it, it's still giving a gift. So that's a whole complicated question, and an insightful one. Yeah. Now, how do we look at contra, you know, contraries? opposites, how they operate. In the, in the, so there's a whole issue on that. But the basic point is that in usual common sense we have some kind of uh, an acceptance. And the acceptance in halacha is by a kinyan, an acquisition act, and so in the halacha, and therefore the person acquires the gift. And that's a, a topic in kinyan, in acquisition. Okay, but what do we see here from this thing we see that somehow it, the acceptance of the Torah by the Jewish people was not by free will. In addition, there's another Chazal which says in the Megillah, Megillah Esther, there is, which was written by Chazal, that's very important, it was written by Chazal, namely that whatever came down from the time of Esther and Mordechai by way of a proto-Esther or writings or oral Balper, something came oral. Chazal wrote, they say Katvu, wrote the text, which means to me they organized what was coming down because I'm not saying I'm not dealing with the history. What happened? Where did it come from? Did they have it first by oral and they translated it and so on? I mean, that's all part of something that happened. But the point is they they wrote, it says they, I say they organized the text into a text that we cut, that's come down to us. And uh, since it was written by Chazal, uh, we had a talk here about Purim. The Megillah Esther was written by Chazal, therefore it had in it methodology of how Chazal look at the different senses, that by letters that they take out a letter that was missing, make a letter of missing, they have the Tav Kri, it's written one way and it's pronounced another way, and different techniques in the Chazal, word order, Vashti Amalka, Malka Vashti, and so on. So they have, in the text of the Megillah, they have these different methodologies of Chazal, and one of them is Kimu Lekiblu. It says in the text, talking about acceptance of the Megillah, of the Mordechai uh, Esther material, 
that the Jews at the time, and indeed we say Jews because by, by that time Mordechai was Mordechai HaYehudi. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about the Hebrews now. We're not talking about 1500 BC. We're ta BC. We're talking about the much later period, closer to the Anshe Knesset and Agdola, which is 135 uh, BCE, something like that. In any event, it went. It was disbanded when I think the destruction of the temple about the year 70. But it was in operation for 200 years, and there's a machloket on exactly the dating and so on and so on. But I would get back to our point. In the text, there's this phrase "kimu v'kiblu," and it doesn't have the vav, a methodology of Hazal, and uh, you can now try to explain all these different things, and in the Perush on Megillah Esther, I explain all these different moves of Chazal. But, in addition to that, Chazal wrote an interpretation, a drash, uh, try to understand what they're talking about, and they applied this, these two words, Kimu v'kiblu, they applied it to the Jews, the Hebrews, accepting the Torah on Mount Sinai. Kiblu, Kimu the Kiblu. They established the Kayen is to establish, to affirm or whatever. To establish the Ma Kiblu, Kibel is to receive. What they received was affirmed, reaffirmed in the time of Anche Kesarakola by the Khazal's Drash on these words, Kimu v'Kibru. So that we, it's the saying, with respect to the Torah, it was accepted, it was received, Kibel, but not affirmed. So they're coming to give you an answer to the question of how this is going. We have the Torah from Mount Har Sinai, we have Nasev and Ishma, we have Harka Gigit, and now we have another Chazal that adds to it and refines it even more by saying that we are now Kimu Bakimu, establishing now at a later time, a thousand years after the whole event, we're establishing what we accepted before. Okay. Now, in addition, to these, or this line that I'm setting forth of Nasa Vedishma, Harka Gigit, Kimu Vakiblu, in the Gemara, in the Talmud, there's a lot of talk about Ezra Hasofer, Ezra the scribe, who was a, a, a prophet, I think one of the last of the prophets, who wrote a book on, he wrote a book on prophecy, on his teachings. But he was a scribe, and the gist of what's said about him in the Gemara, in the Chazal, is that he was fit to receive the Torah. If it wasn't for being somebody like Moshe Rabbeinu, who was the real big giant at the time, 1500 B.C., Ezra Sofer would be fit to receive the Torah. <laughs> now it's not saying it's not as, from one side, it's not as powerful as to say, well, Kimu Kiblu. It's just talking about Ezra Sofer and that he, he, he was fit. He was, it was, he was, it was, it could be appropriately said that if there were no Moshe Rabbeinu, he could accept it. Now we come, what is that all about? So the usual interpretation of Har Sinai, receiving the Torah, is by prophecy. Moshe Rabbeinu talked to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, upon him, upon him, face to face, whatever that means, and he received by nevuah, by prophecy. He was the special, he had special properties compared to others, all the other prophets were, had lesser status of, uh, of uh, understanding. <coughs> Basically it turns on it turns on the role of the understanding in the prophecy, of cutting through the, the way the prophecy is expressed sometimes in metaphor and so forth, and the ability to understand it 
was the distinctive mark of Moshe Rabbeinu. Whereas the other prophets had less understanding of what they received. There is equivocation on what you received. And especially when it comes down in metaphor, it's not direct, direct speech. It's only Moshe Rabbeinu who spoke ponim el ponim, face to face, whatever that means. But the point is that the original Matan Torah, giving of the Torah and, re and its reception, was by prophecy. But when it comes to Ezra, he was a sofer. A sofer is somebody who writes the mezuzah, writes the Sefer Torah. And so, what did Ezra do? Ezra is now late. He received orally written, he received materials that he redacted, put together in a package, and he said, Hare Ze Torah. This has the status, the halachic status of Torah. He has his, uh, his all these ancient Near Eastern materials, okay, and they come down to Ezra. If he didn't say and relate to them by saying, putting a chalos, putting a status, in this case a halachic status, on the material, it remains an ancient Near Eastern text. It has nothing to do with Torah. So when we say that the Torah was given, Mm -hmm. on Har Sinai, we're now following this line, well, that's not quite true. We have ancient Near Eastern texts that talk about the giving of the Torah and the Nevoah. Fine. But, according to Ezra HaSofer, one could interpret him to mean that the stuff that he's putting together is not Torah because it was revealed by a Kodesh Baruch Hu to Moshe through prophecy. The stuff that he's putting together inside of that material, yes, it reports what happened at Sinai. What happened? And there was Moshe the prophet, and the mountain was raw, and this and that, and then you can read it in the Chomish. You have the description. But, according to Ezra Sofer, one could interpret him to mean that when he said, as a sofer, he said, the thing I'm writing now, redacted, okay, has a status which we call Torah. More particularly, Tarshavik Tav. Torah in the writing. Because in the Torah system, Chazal have Tarshavik Tav and Shavar Peh. We have the oral Torah and we have the written Torah. We're not concerned with the oral Torah now. But we're only concerned with what exactly did Ezra do? <laughs> what did he do? So, he had this material come to him and he could have said, okay, I'm going to read it first, see what's in it. You know, I understand Hebrew, I'm going to read what it says. And, you know, and then I, after I read it, I'm going to make sure that I write it, I'm going to be written down in an organized way. And you know, when you look in the Chumash, and you look in the Sefer Torah, you see that it's written with Tuchel and Stumot. With, uh, the typography has visual, visual excellence. Like in the Breshit story, there's an opening on the line. So the line goes, each day has its own opening. It doesn't start right away. In other places, it starts by a few spaces. In some places, it just continues without breaks. So this is a visual, a visual typographical, I was a printer, right? typographical uh, phenomenon. You, you, you gain emphasis. You gain emphasis by separating and not having everything blurred together. When I designed business cards and letterheads, one of the things they always told you was to watch your typefaces, how you put the thing together so that when the guy gets the letterhead, as soon as he has to squint to see what <laughs> your address is, you lost, you lost clout. Well, you got everything has to be balanced, and the type has to be balanced. And, 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 and. As a matter of fact, when I was younger, as I was a printer, I saved business cards. <laughs> I saved business cards, especially ones that were made in color. In those days, 
you know, this goes way back. And in those days, to have a business card that you gave to somebody who had two or three colors means it went through the press three times. You know, we didn't have automatic presses and all the modern stuff. So I used to save business cards. I mean, it was a hobby. <laughs> and of course, I threw them away. <laughs> but it was a hobby, to save, especially the ones that I made, that I designed. <laughs> you know. And then there were pictures and different, different things. And, uh, and uh, letterheads was very big. Uh, so somebody went to a new business, so it was business card, how you give your card out, and how you write a letter, what's on top, the letterhead, you know. This was part of the, uh, of the thing. So, so we have in the, in the writing down of what Ezra received, we have a format. And one of the ingredients in that format is the spacing. Spacing between the lines horizontally and spacing between the lines this way, vertically. And if you look at a Sefer Torah in the shul, you'll see that for yourself. You know, well, we get Elias, but girls don't get the... Well, you're talking about the, the scroll. Right? The scroll, right. When you see the scroll, you, you see this, this typography. Okay. Now the question becomes, what exactly did Ezra include and exclude in his saying, by this words, by these words, I pronounce this material to be Torah. That means what in tradition and anthropology is called sacred text in the Torah system is a performative. Namely, when somebody says in the proper context, these words are the formula for getting married. Mm -hmm. Usually the words, the utterance so. goes together with an action. So there's a ring. And so when you christen a ship, so there's a bottle of champagne that you hit the you hit the ship, the bow of the ship, and you say, Hare Zek, Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> now this is the name of the ship. The ship is not finished until it has a status of ship. In particular, the name. Since Queen Elizabeth, they take off the thing, the champagne. So that's how, well, well, you're establishing a status. So what's called sacred text in anthropology and in cultures, we go to Africa, we can study the different, the different uh, civilizations, even ones that are left over. What's called sacred text is really, upon analysis, a performative. So they have a dance, and they're, <laughs> let's say, restoring the, restoring the, one of the sacred texts for a tribe, okay? So they have a dance, and they have this and that, and so on and so on. But in the dance, are the, when you step back, are the elements of speech, song, whatever, and some kind of an action. So in, a, in effect, a sec, what's called a sacred text in anthropology is at root conceptually putting a performative, putting a status on something, renewing the status, putting a new status on something. So in the Torah system, when we say sacred text, sacred text is another name for what Ezra did by saying Hare Zat Torah Shebiktav. This is Torah Shebiktav. Once he said that, then there are consequences. Like when somebody says Hare Ot and in the right context, if he's a Katan, he's a, below a certain age of six, whatever it is, and he says those words, he said nothing. Well, wait a minute, what do you mean he said nothing? I got it taped. <laughs> On the tape, you hear him say, uh, this little kid saying, Hare Ot Nikodeshali. Or when we have religious kids and they play with a, have play in the street and they have a girl, and the girl is, is six, and the boy is six, and he says, for joking, Hare Ot Nikodeshali. Well, oh, see, we're married. You said the formula. Okay, well, there are conditions that have to be in the, in the situation such that when you perform the utterance with the act, it works, it's called, it's operative on what you did. 
So one minute before you said that, you're single, and the next minute you're married. I now pronounce you. Right, all right. I now pronounce you. You're married. And being, having the right condition, in this case being a normal person, not, with not being a katan, you say that, and you're now married, and that has consequences. Before, the day before, you can go out, go with some gal that you meet, and, and talk, go for coffee and so forth, and, and be, be romantic. And the day after, you, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to go and start to flirt with girls on the idea of having relations and so on and so on. I mean, there are consequences. There are consequences. One of them is you can't change the text. To check, the text can't be changed. It has to be written in a way where it can't be changed. And then there are other things. But the basic point is that this is done by a performative. So the question is, what exactly did the performative that Ezra made, which he called Harei Zeh Torah Shebiktav, what did that consist of? Now in the Halakha, there's a, a, a section of the halakha that deals with how the sofer writes the Sefer Torah, how he writes it. And there are rules. As a matter of fact, I took a course just for fun to see how it is. <laughs> I took a course on Safrut and see how they oh formed the letters and everything. It was very interesting. You know, and uh, of course in the beginning you use the pen and the special quill and, and it doesn't look so much, but as you take the course you start to perfect your your hand motion to do the letters and so on. But in the halakha, in the halakha that deals with the rules of writing a Sefer Torah, from what I understand, from what I understand, the person, the sofer, who's writing, does not have to know what the words mean. Now one of the halakha, one of the rules is, he's responsible to write the letters to inscribe, but he's not <coughs> required to know what the meaning of the words are. So his art is limited and taken account of in the rules in the halakhic system such that he doesn't have to know what's in it. He just has to be able to form the letters according to the rules, the pro which, which pieces across the horizontals and the verticals and so on and so on and the proper quill and all the rest of the things to go with. <laughs> well, that's a, that's... Remember, Ezra so fair. we're talking about somebody who's a scribe. We're not talking about the normal person who doesn't have that skill. But for Ezra, like with that skill of being an expert in, scri in inscribing, when he, when he, I'm sure when he looks at a book, <laughs> he looks at the inscription, at the, you know, uh, when I look at a book, I look at the content, I mean, uh, you know, uh, or you just take it and start reading it, you know, we're not, we're not, but, okay, apprentice, I'm in the middle, so, <laughs> so I, I, like, in the middle, on all the books, in my library, it says somewhere on one of the pages, in the back or in the front, uh, page 67, error. Uh, because I used to make a cap, because I was learning in printing school, there's no book that has no error. Period. Every book that's published has somewhere an error. Spacing error, a comma, uh, not, spelling. Yeah, spelling, so on, so on, so I mean, there are no such things. <laughs> and even in Sefer Torah, when the Torah is written by hand by a sofer, it's been shown that it could go for years without being discovered and bingo, somebody's reading it in the shul <laughs> and he finds an error and he stops reading and if they find an error you have to stop, tie up the Sefer Torah and get another one to oh continue the reading. So it, it's so subtle and well, you know yourself, when you proofread, <laughs> you know it's not so easy because your eye just fills in, your eye and brain just fills in all kinds of stuff, but it's an error, it's a mistake. Anyway, so this is a, a, a halakha, a, a rule, that the sofer does not have to know what the words mean. 
Well, let's go one step further. When Ezra said, if we say Ezra limited his chalos, his status, putting the status on this text, if he limited to the inscription without the meaning, then it has the status of Torah Shabbat, the Torah Shabbat, but the meaning somehow comes in from the reader, comes in from from the guy who knows the language. If you know the language, you could read and understand it. If you don't know the language, we could say, well, may, let's assume, for the sake of argument, Ezra didn't know Hebrew. <laughs> okay, but he could still write. The, he could still write the inscribed. Okay. So if we take Ezra to be saying this, the inscription is Torah, Torah Shavik Sav, has this status, can't be changed, blah, blah, blah. then going with that is the idea that any understanding of the words in the text that's reasonable, that makes sense <coughs> to understanding the language, if you understand the language, Anything that's reasonable is included under the umbrella called Torah. Which means that there's not one special meaning. You could have many, many different meanings of the text, of phrases, of words, and so forth. And we say in the tradition, Ayin Panim La Torah, 70 faces to Torah. In other words, you could have, when you probe the material itself, you could have different meanings, depending on the tools. Like, as you all know, I work with the hieroglyphic basis of Biblical Hebrew, and it's a tool that has shown me many, many differences in the interpretation of phrases and meanings of words in the text. So by having something else, I can discover something inside the text, which has, which is properly called Torah, not because of the discovery, not because of the meaning, but because the, it's carried by inscription, it's carried by something you see on the paper, letters on black space, on white space, and you have letters, and it's inscribed on the, on the material. So if you take Ezra to, be, to mean that, then anything that's discovered where there's reasonable understanding that a phrase carries a package of meaning X, Y, and Z, and that has the status of Torah Sheb Bixav. So now, if we have a, a, a narrow interpretation of Ezra, so, what we then would say is that it includes the meaning. It's just not the inscription, per se. As I give you an example from the Sofer, who doesn't have to know what the words mean. It's, it's not the inscription, per se. It's the inscription carrying a package of meaning. Like when we write something, uh, we're not in the position of the software. I mean, we're not learning how to write. We're, ca we're communicating. We're trying to get across the content of what we're writing. The writing is not the essential part. The writing has a dimension of keeping it unchangeable. Blah, 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 blah. But, but basically, we're interested in communicating the content. So if we interpret Ezra, Ezra is kolos. Ezra is saying, Hare ze Torah. If we interpret that to include a, a, a set of meanings, then indeed, the idea of revelation of Moshe Rabbeinu receiving the Torah by it being revealed to him as a prophet is paradigmatic for the meaning of the words in the text. But the words don't give you the basis of the material being Torah. The, the basis of material being Torah is the chalos, the status that Ezra put on it. In the wide interpretation of just the inscription, 
the all any meanings take their status of Torah from the fact that Ezra put the status on the material. And the other way around, if one says, okay, I read the material and I see that it says, look, he went, there was the mountain and it had this situation in the mountain and it was all this and so on and so on and people understood and Moshe Rabbeinu went up to the mountain and God talked to him and gave him the Torah. That's by Elohim, he it says by the finger of God and so on. So if that's in the material and indeed it's certainly one package of meaning. It's lasted for three, <laughs> for five thousand years. I mean, but the question is, the question is, what is the status of that meaning package? So it follows from Ezra, however you interpret him, a wide interpretation or a narrow interpretation. It turns out to be that. The material, the text that we're reading is Torah because Ezra put the chalos of Torah on it, not because of revelation. What that means, and a more simply put, is that what happened, how it happened at Har Sinai is a second order question, and in this context becomes personal depending on how you read the material. It's been read for so many thousands of years as being a revelation. God revealed himself to Moshe Rabbeinu, and that's what's come down as a standard meaning for, for almost everybody in Judaism and, and Western religions built on the Bible. There is this thing of revelation and so on. Okay, but the question here is that it's a second it's a second step. The first step is Torah via Ezra's Chalos and not by what happened. So what happened in effect becomes personal. No matter what you say happened, if it's reasonably carried by the material, you say, look, I, I believe that. I don't know what the revelation is. I can't understand Panim al Panim. I can't understand HaKadosh Baruch talking to Moshe Rabbeinu like a... a, a a person talks to a friend. And indeed, Maimonides, the Rambam, spent the first part of Maimonides, of his, one of his philosophical works, on trying to explain to the reader of the Chumash all of these places where it says, Vaydaber Hashem, Vayomer Hashem, Yoreid Hashem, and so on. All the verbs and all the material giving you an explanation. And indeed, it turns out that if you study the Rambam material, you see that he is giving, he has a, a hidden agenda, shall we say, where his interpretation of those psukim and examples in the text are really coming from a conception of how the mind works, which he took over from the Greeks, more particularly from Aristotle. So that, that, that what it says, Vaydaber Hashem or Vayomer Hashem or whatever the, the phrase is, he has a, a package, a conceptual package, to get the reader to see. It's certainly not, when it says, Vaidabe and Hashem al Moshe, if you were there with a tape recorder, you wouldn't get anything Vaidabe. You won't get Dibur. You won't get talking. You won't get a, a videotape. Uh, but when it says Vaidabe, it's translated or transformed into mental categories such that even though there was nothing heard, hearing, you didn't hear any words, it's reasonable to say, by Daber Hashem, or by Yomer Hashem, or whatever it happens to be. So the Rambam then, based on his philosophical depth, gives you one package of meanings of the text in the first part of Mar Nebuchim. So we see from the very work, from the very activity, and he differs from others who read the text because he has this package of how the mind operates, its structures, its functions, how the mind is operating, such that it makes reasonable to say by Daber, by Yorid, and so on and so on. So that he's putting forth a, uh, he's filling in a content. Okay. So, this opens the door now to somebody else who 
can put in other content. As strange as it sounds, mm -hmm. one can find reasonable understanding of what's written in the text, which does not hold, or does not affirm the usual interpretation that there was a revelation and God spoke to uh, Moses and so forth. As a matter of fact, for most people today, Dati, religious people, they don't think about it. What that means? But, when pushed to the wall, they don't have to take the Rambam. I mean, they may not even understand the Rambam. But, if you'd ask them what, what was there, if you had a video tape there, would you hear, would you hear the words or not? Is it Nivoa or not Nivoa? Yeah. What, no, what are you saying? No, I'm saying Nivoa, the usual context of Nivoa, but what's going on, what happens? What, 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 what do we see, what do we hear? Are the senses operative in terms of the experience? What's going on? So what I'm saying is that when you take the Rambam example, he gives you a package and an explanation of what's going on to avoid the idea that God speaks in the same sense that you and I speak. Namely, if we had a tape recorder, we'd hear the words. Hmm. Okay? But mo most people who, who accept the Torah belief, this, this, this belief that was so intrinsic for this Jewish identity, of uh, 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 agreeing with the belief that God spoke to Moses on Har Sinai, when you don't think about it, you're okay. <laughs> when you think about it, you've got a problem, because you've got to explain what that means. <laughs> but when you don't think about it, okay. If somebody would say, uh, do you actually hear anything? i say, well, maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you don't have a theory to go with it that transforms the material and puts it onto a conceptual framework, then... Uh, 50% at least will say, look, I don't know what happened, but uh, it sounds like, <laughs> pardon me, <laughs> it sounds like there was actual, you know, speech. There was actual, and in the text they even give you a description of what's happening and so on and so on and so on. Okay, so the point is now that, look what we've moved from. we moved from Nasev and Ishma by the Hebrew people, relating to what Moshe Rabbeinu gave them, and the revelation, to a meaning of Torah that's based on a, on a Ezra Sofer saying, uh, putting a halos, putting a status, indeed a halachic status, on the <coughs> thing called Tereshim so, from these examples and the, the line that I'm developing, it follows that indeed if somebody could come up with another understanding of the phrases and of the senses and of the material, just like the Rambam used a conception of the mind from the Aristotelian understanding of the mind, so somebody else can use something else and come up with a different understanding package of the words. But the understanding package does not make it Torah. The understanding package is Torah because it's carry, being carried with the inscription that Ezra made the Chalosna. So, indeed, when you go this way, this guy, uh, others who wrote this whole idea about uh, God gave the Torah to the Jewish people and a Jewish identity requires this belief. What comes out of this whole analysis is that Jewish identity does not require this belief. As strange as it sounds, or as difficult it is to accept, it logically follows from the analysis that I'm tr presenting. In other words, it has a status of Torah because Ezra put the chalos of Torah 
made it operative on the text, and the meaning package comes in from who's reading it. <laughs> when the Rambam read it, his meaning package was such that he was able to write a whole section of anthropomorphisms and show you that it doesn't mean literally that you would be there, you would, you would hear the speech and so on and so on and so on. So others say, well, we don't understand it at all, what that means. It's an unknowable. We're not, we're, how, do we, how are we privy to understand Kodesh Baruch and what he says and how it operates and so on. But the point is that the ideational door opens via Ezra Sofer to include as Torah, as Torah, hmm. a package which excludes Revelation. Hmm. Now, who is going to buy that in Judaism is a separate story. But all I'm presenting tonight is the package and the underpinning that leads to that conclusion. And Chazal gave many, many hints about that relate to this. And one of them is that when you read the text and it says Hashem, and it says Elohim, Chazal gave the hint explicit in the Gemara that Elohim refers to the Nachash, the snake, the serpent in the story of Gan Eden saying that if you will eat from the Eitz Hadas Tovara, you will be like Elohim Yodei Tovara. So that understanding, making judgments, which Chazal called Din, making judgments about good and bad, Okay, making judgments of good and bad was the was the one eight says us that was one tree, and that's carried by Elohim. That's what it says right in, explicitly in the text. The Nocha says to Chava about eating from this tree that if you eat from this tree, you'll be like Elohim, knowing good and evil. And as you know from hearing me speak before, you know that in the Chumash a lot of things are not said explicitly but are implicit in the way the material is presented. When you talk, the Nachash says, when you eat from the Eitz Hadas Tovara, you'll be like Elohim, you're there Tovara. But when you, now the Nachish in his back pocket pulls out and says, hey, 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 wait a minute, I'll tell you something else. <laughs> that when you eat from the Eitz HaChayim, you'll be like Hashem, Yud Kevavke. There are two fundamental names for HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the Torah, Hashem and Elohim. So Chazal gave you the hint by saying, when you use the word Elohim, it refers to having eaten from the Eitz Hadas Tovara, making judgments about good and bad. It gets extended in many different ways, but the basic idea that Chazal present is this picture. And on the other hand, the other half that the Nachash didn't say is, if you're like Elohim, if you eat from this tree, then you're like Hashem if you eat from the other tree. So that we then have a different picture from Chazal themselves. So they said, whenever it says Hashem, it has to do with Rachmim. Whenever it has Din, it has to do with justice, with morality, with strict judgment. And then they have Chazal deal with the question that a Kodesh Baruch Hu decided to make a universe based on Din, on law, on structure, but he changed his mind because the human being could never be able to carry such a, such a load. So he had to have mellow, some kind of a mellowing procedure. He had to have some place in the, in the punitive system like in common law where the president or the prime minister can free 
somebody who served uh, 15 years of a 25-year sentence, and so on. That's Rachman. Now, he says, another dimension to the judgment, to the penal system. So, and there are other examples of what Rachman is. But the point is that this is what the text is giving you. And so, it's providing you with an understanding package that may be different from the Rambam, but with respect to it being called Torah, it does not depend on there being a revelation. And that's the basic point that I want to get across, to show that this opens up the door. Now, indeed, when Chazal, they, Chazal gave this as a remez, as a hint, because, you know, Chazal read the text. It doesn't say Eitz HaRachman, it says <laughs> HaChaim. But one example, one primary <coughs> example of Chaim is the feeling of mercy and being sorry and empathizing and so on and so on. Indeed, in more general terms, the Elohim relates to judgment made by the mind, judgments of good and bad, din, making a judgment, dealing with a, a rule and exceptions to the rule, authority for the rule. That's cognitive. cognitive. It's from the area of the, of, the, of the person called the cognition. And relationally to that, things that go on in the body of the person, and in the feelings of the person come from Hashem. So that we start to widen up what the meaning is. Chazal gave the hint. But after you take the hint, you see that there are many, many, many different package of meanings that's underneath Hashem. And basically, in relation, relationally speaking, in relation to Elohim, which is cognitive, cognition, Hashem is affect, emotion, sensitivity, feeling, and so forth. So that in the text we have this picture, and Ezra opened the door to alternative understandings of the text, which do not require the belief that this guy wants to say is essential for Jewish identity. If 90% of Jews don't accept the belief, well, maybe if we showed from inside the material, not outside, from inside the material and the announcement, and we showed that it's not required, well, I can't believe that nobody out of this population, not one would say, well, wait a minute, I've got to re-examine my commitment to Torah. <laughs> Nobody? Nobody? If you're showing logically and conceptually an alternative, well, we have the beginning point of a shift, of a shift of emphasis, a shift of understanding, that in this particular detail will bring Torah back in the relevance, to make it more relevant for the 85-90% of Jews who don't accept it. They don't accept the traditional story because when you say something and you do it God talk, they don't know what you were talking about. They're in a quandary and they say, well, I don't know what we're talking about. So they, most of them who are serious, they'll study the Rambam first. That's what I did. Of course, but after you graduate from the Rambam, <laughs> after all, the Rambam is built on a conception of the mind that's basically Greek, coming from the Aristotelian Platonic understanding of the world. And since the scientific revolution in the 17th century, that understanding has been replaced by a much richer understanding of the human being, of the social aspect, psychological aspect, and the mental aspect. And the whole a different understanding of the, the whole relationship. So most people today, they may flirt with the Marnebuchim, but after a while, 
study will yield that it's not satisfactory. And I studied it for many years, and I found that after a while, being in philosophy, I outgrew it because it wasn't really powerful enough to carry the understanding. But it certainly said, well, don't be afraid to think about the text. Don't be afraid to look at it in a big picture, in a wide screen. That you do learn from the Rambam, and that has a great value. And Chazal uh, say, and I discovered in my own studies of the Chumash text, that indeed, when Chazal say the Torah speaks in the language, speaks about God in the language of man, that means the more you know about man, and the language of man, the more you know about God. So that there's what I call operational definition. These are operational definitions. Whenever you say Elohim, whenever you say Hashem, these words are carrying not just Din and Rachmim, but something even broader and more conceptual. The cognitive and the affective part of the human being. Because the, how the human being operates with these things gives you understanding of Hashem. The Torah speaks about God in the language of man. And it's giving you an operational definition, how to understand it in the text. And as you know from past experience with me, I discovered by working through each one in the text. There's 1,800 places where it says Hashem, 250 places where it says Elohim, and I took the trouble to work through and comment on each one and say, why does it say Elohim in this story and not Hashem, and vice versa. When you do that, you get an eye-opening that's unbelievable. Nobody took the trouble, none of the Mephorshim took the trouble to do the whole text. They all mention, every single one mention this Chazal, and what the uh, word Hashem and Elohim carry. But they didn't do the whole text. They didn't take heed and say, look, Chazal. It doesn't say Rachmim, it says Chaim. Chaim is much wider. Chaim includes the body functions, how the human being operates, what's going on in the body system, what's going on in the feeling system, how the how, how action and you, things that a person does are coming in with ingredients from both. All of that you glean when you look at the names, each one in particular context. Because then you can ask the question, why in this context, this particular story, okay, look how important the narrative has become. I mean, in the traditional medieval Rambam classification, it wasn't the narrative that was important. It was the more conceptual pieces, the halacha, the legal pieces and so forth, and the metaphysical pieces. But here we have the, na the narratives. The narratives take on a tremendous value because they're, we have to probe in in the nature of human man, mankind, to understand how the text is operating. So when you deal with each one in particular in context, you indeed build up a field, a whole package of meanings for the words that can reasonably be, be carried by Hashem and reasonably be carried by Elohim. So it turns out, indeed, that Rachmim is Chazal's hint to say, oh, oh, wait a minute, if you examine each one in 1800 places, you're not going to come out with Rachmim alone, you're going to come out with all kinds of subtlety meanings and in the realm of the emotions. Wow! The, the subtlety that goes into a human being having feelings. There's a cognitive component, there's an actual component, and then there's the grades of feeling. It's like in color perception, right? You can have a continuum of color perception on a thing here, you know, and move from one end of the spectrum to the other, and look at all the shades, look at all the shades of color in the, in the middle. Each one of those is being carried by Hashem. 
But which one of those is being carried by Hashem requires going into the context of the story. If you just say Hashem, and before I did all this work, most of us read the text, Hashem. We know what that means. <laughs> it's Hashem. But, 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 but without the probing of all of this, you don't get, you don't fulfill what Chazal said, that the Torah speaks about HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the language of man. Yeah. But this means that the original storyteller, before it became Chalos, knew what he was doing when he wrote Hashem in one place and Elohim in another, or she, whoever wrote well, it. Well, well. We can assume that the story, original well, storyteller of the Middle well, Eastern story. Well, this is open Torah. because it's historical and it's open. However, it's reasonable. Right? That's the Moshe. That's Moshe's blitz. I mean, storytellers were great blitz. artists in those days. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but that's. I'd like to say <laughs> there's not enough evidence for that. But I'd like to say that Moshe's greatness in writing the text. Well. I call it, see, it's very interesting, John. I mean, it's, I call it Torah's Moshe, a perush on Torah's Moshe. Now, it's very interesting that in the 19th century, in the biblical scholars' world, okay, when they wrote a perush, a commentary on the, on, on the text, okay, you will not find the word Torah. Wellhausen and the German school and others, and for a hundred years, you will not find the word Torah. When you take the Malbin, and you take the Ramban, and you take the pre-Greek, pre-17th century texts, and post-17th century texts, go to the shelf, it'll say, Torah, Perush on Torah. <laughs> In the Torah world, the Dati world, the people <coughs> following the Torah system, the names of the books, the perushim on the text, carried the word Torah. Chamei Chumshe Torah. You don't have to use the word. Torah was in the title, go right down the line. It's very interesting to know that today, more and more Chacham uh, Yisrael, more and more biblical scholars <laughs> who do not believe who do not believe in the revelation, mm. but have spent li a lifetime working on the text to try to understand it, more and more they call the word Torah. Never would have such a thing. Is there a guy who wrote a 600-page book? And it says, Commentary on the Torah. If you read his other books, he's talking about the Bible. See? He uses the word Bible. But when it came to his perush on the, to on, the, on the text, he said the word commentary on the Torah. Well, now, in part, it's business. <laughs> he wanted it to be taken to shul. So mm -hmm. in a conservative shul, for example, the reader could take the text. He has the Chumash text as well as his, his commentary. And so it's, it's not unreasonable to call it Torah. Now, on the interpretation that I'm giving of Ezra, What's wrong? It is Torah. But it's not Torah based on Revelation. The guy doesn't believe in Revelation. Most of these biblical scholars are having an axe to grind against religion, against <laughs> theology. They're not, and indeed, that's what gave them the, the opening to say things that were chidushim. Because they didn't have, they weren't bogged down by this top pressure of having to accept and work with and live within this tenet of revelation. They, they, they deny that, but they're still interested in the text. So they put in effort and work and this and that to come up with some things which are chidushim. And I found over the years, Torah Miti, on the one hand, doesn't require the, this understanding of revelation, but on the other hand, has nothing to fear from alternative understanding packages so long as they enter the arena of argumentation to, this, to conclude, oh, this is impossible. This is so far-fetched that it can't carry, it can't be carried by the words. 
So the elves come along and said, no, it sounds crazy, but it's not far-fetched. So coming in with new tools, with new material, with new insight, following the Chazal principle. I'm not, this is not Joel Levinson talking. This is, to, I'm talking in the name of Chazal, giving this interpretive picture to make place for a widening of study of the text and indeed a further unification of the Jewish people. Because one of the things that contributed to the fragmentation of the Jews in the contemporary world was all of these biblical studies that had an axe to grind and made all kinds of pictures about what was going on in the text. And so they denied the revelation. But the revelation was taken to be the tenet that you had to believe in in order to be Jewish, in order to be a Torah person. So that, co that itself, the research that itself was part of the cause for different, for breaking off what we call Dati from Chiloni. Not the total picture, but one of the ingredients is the understanding of the material. And indeed, in the age of proliferation, we have Bible, and we have Anchor Bible, and this Bible, and translations, and new, <laughs> new things. So what we have here is uh, a carryover, for the most part, from the, the sides of the picture. So here's a guy, and others like him, with, with all full sincerity, is saying, on the one hand, I recognize that nobody's accepting this, the revelation. But on the other hand, Revelation is key for Jewish identity. Well, maybe take the hint the other way around. What? All these people are ignoramuses. All these people, 85% of Jews are not, they're, they're still Jews. They're, they're part of Kali Yisrael. So maybe by restructuring, by shifting the paradigm, and Chazal say every generation Torah people are responsible to restate the Torah system. In as much with as much relevance as possible to the contemporary picture of where we are. So what I try to do tonight was to give a, a picture, to paint a picture in the con in a few concepts here, that indeed does that and says, look, instead of just saying, well, we are Torah people, everybody else is not. Maybe they're also Torah people, but they can learn from us and we can learn from them. They could learn the tradition, and we could learn the Chidushim. We could do the picture. So, what we see here is that the, I mentioned the point about the, the titles. Very interesting when you look at the titles. Torah becomes, in a, in a, a non-believing person, doesn't believe in this tenet, he could write and study and call his book, his commentary, commentary on the Torah. <laughs> And I say, from one hand, you say it's business, you know, you sell more copies and all the rest of the stuff. Okay, 600 page book uh, falls apart eventually. But okay. So part of it, I give the benefit of the doubt to business and money making and somebody going to take it to shul and read it, you know, okay. But on the other hand, it was unheard of. A guy would never call his book by the name Torah. Because Torah meant. Nasa Venishma. Torah meant the first interpretation. So the guy, he doesn't believe in all that. He's not going to call his book Torah. But today, that line is starting to <laughs> wither. And I say that underneath it, unknown to the guy who wrote his book, and believe it, his perush, much to be desired. I mean, he's a biblical scholar. He works with the, you know, the documentary hypothesis we, we talked about and he discovered some very interesting things and so on but on the whole I mean without being immodest or anything what I wrote on certain things in, in the text in the page that I write has much more richness <laughs> much more content than what he's written in his 600 pages <laughs> well remember he's not analyzing each name in the context He's not doing all of that. He's not coming in to say the Torah speaks in the language of man, let's get more understanding of the human being and we'll get more understanding of the system. He's not doing that. When he says Hashem, when he says uh, Elohim, Lord, or whatever he translates it, 
That's it. He leaves that un, undeveloped, I'm not researched. Yeah. Well, 1,800 places, 1,800 places in the Chumash, where it says Hashem, well, if you analyze each one, you come up with a fantastic package. And eventually, others will do that, and we will have here at least one, another dimension. This is not the total picture, but it's certainly one dimension in Jewish identity. There are other things much more, other things that relate to Jewishness, what I call Jewishness, how it's to define that, how it operates, but from the cognitive point of view, from the conceptual point of view, from the belief in tenets, in, in, in principles of the system, this is a fundamental picture. The Rambam in his, in his 13 principles, right, includes this principle of receiving the Torah and so on. But he, didn't, he knew the halacha, but it didn't have any pull. As with the Sofer, it, it didn't have any pu sufficient pull on the Rambam to shed the traditional view. It had to wait for closer to our time to begin to shed the traditional view, substitute something that's just as rich, if not richer, and operative on Chazal's principles themselves, where the Torah speaks in the language of man, about God in the language of man, and these are what we call operational definitions. Contra, you know, contraries, opposites, how they operate. In, in the, so there's a whole issue on that. But the basic point is that in usual common sense, we have some kind of uh, an acceptance. And the acceptance in halacha is by a kinyan, an acquisition act, and so in the halacha, and therefore the person acquires the gift. And that's a, a topic in kinyan, in acquisition. Okay, but what do we see here from this thing? We see that somehow it, the acceptance of the Torah by the Jewish people was not by free will. In addition, there's another Chazal which says in the Megillah, Megillah Esther, there is, which was written by Chazal, that's very important. It was written by Chazal, namely that whatever came down from the time of Esther and Mordechai by way of a proto-Esther or writings or oral balper or something came oral, Chazal wrote, they say katvu, wrote the text, which means to me they organized what was coming down because I'm not, saying, I'm not dealing with the history. What happened? Where did it come from? Did they have it first by oral, then they translated it, and then so on? I mean, that's all part of something that happened. But the point is, they, they wrote, it says, they, I say they organized the text into a text that we cut, that's come down to us. And uh, since it was written by Chazal, uh, we had a talk here about Purim. The Megillah Esther was written by Chazal, therefore it had in it methodology at that time, the Jewish people received the Torah without free will. And there's a famous Chazal, they, put, they were standing at the foot of the mountain of Har Sinai, and they, they put a barrel over on top of them and said, in effect, you have no choice, you've got to accept the Torah now. So it wasn't accepted by free will, by choice. It was accepted under duress, or even from the positive that the experience of Yitziat Mitzrayim was so powerful that they didn't, it, it, it affected the emotion, the decision of what happened after that didn't come, it came from the experience, but still bypassed free will. You could do something because of this from the side, it was so powerful an experience that it just carried over naturally into accepting the Torah. But the point of this Chazal is, in the Gemara, that it wasn't done by free will. Now, that says a lot. One of the things most important it says is that somehow the Jewish people are hanging in the middle. They need something to complete the acceptance of the Torah. God could give it, 
but where was the acceptance? You know, like if somebody's giving you a matana, a gift, and you don't accept it, there's a question whether you gave a gift. Giving a gift means somebody receiving the gift, or whether giving the gift means giving, but you don't receive it, it's still giving a gift. So that's a whole complicated question, and an insightful one. Yeah. Now, how do we look at them for this guy and others like him who wrote last week? That included, as a fundamental tenet, a fundamental thing, that there was a giving of the Torah to the Jewish people on Mount Sinai. And he says, as far as he's concerned, this particular guy, which is echoed by many others, that's essential, essentially a part of Jewish identity. Along with other things, but certainly this. So, even though it's not well known, nevertheless it's one of the most important holidays because it commemorates the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people. But he also admits in his articles... I'm sorry, who is the he? Uh, in the Jerusalem Post? Guy. Yeah. He didn't want to say. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, he also admits that all, most people outside, the great majority or all of the people outside of the Dati people, do not believe this. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Okay. So, first point is that Har Sinai has no special status in the Torah system. It has no holiness, it has no Kedusha, it's not commemorated by anything. The giving of the Torah is commemorated, by Shavuot, but that it was given at Har Sinai is not essential to the commemoration. So the holiday is saying, here's the giving of the Torah, but it happened to be at Har Sinai. What's important is that the Torah was given by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to Moshe Rabbeinu. That's the Ikar. Okay, so in the Chumash text we have the Jewish people uh, at the time saying, Nase Venishma. When Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them about this Torah that he's receiving, you know, they said, Nase Venishma. And it's repeated a different way and so on, but the basic point is they said they're going to do and follow the Torah and attend to it. Watch it. And I'm not interested tonight in getting into what, what's the Naseh Benishma. There's a lot of material on doing and hearing. Usually you hear first and then you do. Uh, that's not the point for tonight. The basic point is that they had this acceptance of the Torah, of the Torah system. Uh, indeed, in Chazal, in the sages of the Talmud, they talk about the experience of Yamsuf of Yitzhak Mitzrayim, the Jewish people at the time had an experience higher than Yechezkel the Novi. In other words, there was a tremendous, tremendous impact of the Yitzhak Mitzrayim on the people, and this carried over into, into their saying, yes, we're going to keep this Torah. Okay. But the question is, so they say not seven Ishma. By the time we come to the Chazal in the Gemara, which is a thousand years later, we see something very interesting. Chazal say, well, lest we be celebrated Shavuot. Out of all the holidays in Judaism, outside of the halacha, Torah, Orthodox Jews who keep the mitzvot, you know, and they understand Pesach, Shavuot, and all that Outside of these people, which is a very small minority of the Jewish people today, Shavuot is the least known holiday. Sukkot, it's, first of all, it's seven days, and then an eighth day, 
you sit outside in the in the sukkah and so forth. The Pesach people know because they eat matzah and so forth. At least they know that there's something something a holiday called Pesach. Uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kip, everybody knows that and so forth. But Shavuot is one day in the states, two days, and nobody really heard about it. However, what does it commemorate? Shavuot commemorates the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people, or to the Hebrews, whatever, on Mount Sinai. And last week, when we had the Chag, so there were a number of articles in the newspapers <coughs> saying, saying, taking the opportunity to talk about uh, Jewish identity and what, how do we relate to this whole issue. So, this guy says that Jewish identity requires the belief that at Sinai God gave the Torah to the Jewish people. In other words, part of any identity of Jewishness, of Judaism,